We don't want death by the cure. We want to maximize velocity and minimize risk. Those two things have to come together. I believe 100% of the injuries are, are training related. One of the issues is that we need to make a determination between whether the athlete's throwing arm is fatigued, if it has inhibited recovery, or if it's weak. Ryan Croden, uh, welcome to the Tread Podcast. Excited to have you here. Awesome, man. It's exciting. I, I follow your stuff and uh, you're a great teacher. So I'm glad I can be on. Yeah, I really appreciate that. And, you know, I know uh, you're starting to get a little bit of a name in the industry, but uh, certainly a lot of our followers are not uh, completely aware of who you are, of what the Arm Care app and team are working on. Uh, could you give us like the two minute background on yourself and then how you got started with the Arm Care team? And then we'll kind of dive into real quick uh, what you guys yeah, are doing. Yeah, sure. There. So, I guess I'll try to keep this as short as possible. I, uh, I played independent league baseball. I came home, so I was playing in Germany. I came home and tried to figure out what I was going to do with my career. And uh, parents wanted me to be a medical doctor. And I couldn't stop reading the uh, Strength and Conditioning Journal and the Journal of Strength and Conditioning Research from the NSCA. I was a strength coach at the time, a CSCS uh, playing ball. And I said, you know what, I want to be, be a doctor in baseball. I want to do a PhD in, uh, in exercise science. You know, I went to the University of Buffalo. I got a strength coaching volunteer assistant job with Buddy Morris, the legendary Buddy Morris, who's with the Arizona Cardinals, been there for a while, uh, amazing uh, high performance specialist in football. Um, and then I was actually brought on as, a, as a, a GA for the baseball team. So as a coach and strength and skill which uh, was amazing for me and and doing my PhD. But uh, I needed to pay for school and I played baseball in Israel. They had uh, one pro league there and uh, I had to pay my subjects. So my research was in stride length compensations. I really wanted to understand how uh, pitchers fatigued and I created models in terms of what would happen to functional strength, what would happen to physiology, endocrinology. I took blood from them. I took saliva out of their mouths. Um, and then also looking at the 3D motion capture, so some of the kinetic chain interactions. But I needed to pay for these simulated games. And like people read research, 99% of them are 10 pitch assessments. It doesn't really work well for fatigue analyses. So, um, you know, I had them there for three hours. And the only way to do it was to go back and play ball because my uh, teaching assistantship ran out and uh, ended up hitting the first home run in the Israeli Baseball League put me on the map for one person. The director of player development was Dan Duquette at the time for this league. And uh, about a year later, no, not a year later. It was, a, it was about three or four years later, he became the GM of the Orioles. And I just put myself on LinkedIn and I had a message and it said, do you want a job from, from Dan Duquette, who was the, uh, who was the GM. And uh, I became the assistant strength coach and the athletic performance analyst and a roving coordinator for the Baltimore Orioles. So that started my major league career. Prior to, I was working for the Cardinals as a short season strength coach um, during my PhD years. Um, but uh, I was there for a while and uh, ended up wanting to do a, a postdoctoral fellowship. Um, there wasn't a huge research involvement it, at, with the Orioles. I was a biomechanist, but we, we weren't really bringing in biomechanical technology to use in-house. And I felt that I was really lacking uh, greater understanding there. And started the pen throwing clinic where we looked at orthopedic surgery uh outcomes we looked at pre-injury we looked at 3d biomechanics and I, and I got into this dynamometry world and for people that don't know dynamometry you know that's force testing for it could you know a force plate is a dynamometer for your lower body um, but i got into uh, portable hand dynamometry and the biodex which is an isokinetic dynamometer where you can match speed and, and look at strength qualities at different degrees per second. So I got really into it and I realized, man, I got to really understand this stuff because it, it has a, a relationship to fatigue. And then uh, halfway through the postdoctoral fellowship, I got hired by the Angels and uh, became the director of performance integration there. And I was overseeing strength and conditioning, sports medicine data, as far as monitoring um, uh, player health and farming out individualized arm care programs um and strength and conditioning and then i was running proprietary combines for uh, draft hopefuls so i started to learn a little bit about what the amateur side of things look like from an athletic performance perspective and also an orthopedic perspective um 
and uh, and then we used dynamometry. We integrated it with the Angels, and for two years, we didn't have any pitching surgeries at the major league level in our active roster. Only team to do that. Only team during COVID, not to have any uh, surgeries to the active roster. We cut our IL days in the minor leagues um, due to arm injuries in half, fifty percent. And then we also cut our actual Tommy John surgeries in half. It was the first time that we had, we had less than uh, double digits in Tommy John. So um, it opened my eyes to dynamometry and I had to do some deep diving into why are we still having injuries? And we realized that we had a great process at home. I mean, there are a lot of people. So it wasn't just the dynamometry that were involved, um, but we weren't evaluating our players on the road. So I was stuck saying, well, what do we do? And it just so happens I saw a, a, a coach sent me this uh, link to armcare.com. And I was like, whoa, what is this thing? Right. Uh, and, it, you know, players wear it. They go anywhere they want. Um, and, I, and for me, I was like, I'm missing data. I need this. And I talked to the owner who is Dugan Morin. And um, he also owns Crossover Symmetry, uh, which people know the, the training brand. And uh, I just got so interested in it. And um, they were making changes with the Angels. And some of the things that I was doing was being restructured. And it just, it wasn't going to work out for me. And uh, Dugan said, um, you know, I'd like to bring you on full time in an executive role to help further the analytics with this application and also to create education, how to create a certified program about creating individualized arm care programs based on data. So, you know, that's where I am today. And um, it, it's been amazing. I've been so grateful, man, and, and meeting people like you and, um, you know, people in, in the Major League Baseball circuit, they, they sometimes miss the opportunity to learn from others. And, um, and that's what this product has really opened up for me. Yeah, I know for me, I've, I've been very impressed with, with you and the educational material that you're putting out. Um, and also just the fact that like you have the experience playing, but you also have experience as a, as a researcher. So you have the academic experience, but again, you, you have experience in the trenches as a coach too, and then experience integrating and overseeing the medical side, you know, the strength and conditioning side, the skill side, and how do all these pieces come together? So for me, like you're, you're definitely, uh, one of those rare people who has experience in all those different disciplines. I like to think that I have experience in a lot of those, but definitely not in the, now I have an undergrad degree in kinesiology and exercise science, but you know, not to the level that you've actually run research studies, you have, you know, published work. Um, so I find that very interesting to get your perspective whenever I have questions about different types of topics. If you could like name the mission of the arm care uh, app or the arm care uh, company, like what are you guys trying to do? What are you guys trying to change within the game of baseball right now? Real simple eradicate arm injuries, dominate pitching performance. This is used for position players too, but the injuries are very rare when they happen. happen. And, um, you know, we, we notice a lot of things with this eradicate arm injuries and dominate pitching performances that, you know, people are losing jobs. It's not just a player. You know, most players after a Tommy John surgery, they, they exist for four years at the major league level. At the minor league levels, it's not, you don't know, you know, because a lot of those guys don't make it up there. But Coaches are getting fired. Medical staff, you're, you're seeing it. Medical staff being fired. I just had a friend, a high-level position on the major league team, being fired over injuries. So it's not just eradicate arm injuries and dominate pitching performance. It's, it's about creating career longevity for people who are supporting these athletes in a role where they manage workload. People ask me, like, what's the greatest predictor of pitching injuries? And it's pitching, Right. So we have to be able to understand how to uh, allocate those stresses and how to remediate things. So, you know, we just have a data led process for that, you know, and I also say one of our missions is just to educate others in a new way. You know, we're talking about, I, I just put out a, a class for the 2022 Baseball Performance Summit, and it's a whole concept called strength and coordination. And, uh, and that's really a big mission for us is like, how do we connect the dynamometry, the force testing data to the three-dimensional data, to the anthropometric data, to the psychological data, to uh, the motor preferences? You know, all of these things have to go in to create a hyper-personalized program. And, uh, and we, need to, we need to get there. If we want to maximize velocity and minimize risk, 
those two things have to come together. Could you describe for people just quickly, like how the Arm Care, Arm Care app works, like how the process works? Uh, obviously, we, we don't use it at Tread. Uh, any of our in-house athletes that come in for visits, we run them through the, the full exam. Uh, but just describe for people who aren't familiar, you know, they get a strength sensor basically with their package. They download this app on their phone. And, you know, they're trying to get all this data on predicting injuries, but how do they actually go through the testing? Like, what does that testing right, protocol right. look like? How long does I it mean, take? the thing is, is, when people ask me this question, how does it work? The first thing I want to answer is, why is it helpful? You know, so people understand what's the purpose of it. Um, and throughout my time in baseball, I, I believe 100% of the injuries are, are training related, either throwing workload uh, prescriptions or um, in the weight room. Uh, one of the issues is that we need to make a determination between whether the athlete's throwing arm is fatigued, if it has inhibited recovery, or if it's weak. One of the issues that happens in the world of baseball is you're testing athletes in a fresh state. And if they come up weak, you don't know if they're fatigued and you may be you know, overworking their arm. Or if they're not fatigued and they don't have inhibited recovery and they're just weak, you could be under training it. And so you're still left with these strength and deficits and imbalances. And the key with this technology is that it goes anywhere with the athlete. You need a fixed surface to press into, okay? We, we want to eliminate anybody else's help. We're trying to make the athlete autonomous. There's an IMU in it where you can, you can measure range of motion. Um, and we need to be able to balance strength and length. So muscle length and tendon length versus the strength of those muscles, um, both like an opposite action of what they do and also with, along with the same action of that motion. But we, we screen, so we test before we throw. It's like a minute test. We call it a primer. It's also a potentiator. It gets the arm ready by activating it with a high amount of force. And, uh, and then we do the testing before bullpen days or every 72 hours for a reliever or if it's a position player, we pick one day a week. The whole key is just not to do a, uh, a upper body lift within 24 hours because it will skew the data. But I think what nails us uh, as the best company out there in the monitoring space for throwing arm athletes is that we have a method to test after games quite easily. And so making the comparison of uh, a fatigue relative um, to your fresh state, it gives you an understanding of, of where the arm's at, you know, how does it respond to high intensity throwing, you know? Um, and, you know, for the, the people who are out there, they're doing weighted ball training, velocity enhancement training. Um, this is an essential tool, man. We're, we're getting it in everywhere. You know, I'm glad that you've adopted it because, um, you know, you have just a high level program. There's top velocity. There's a lot of great people in the industry that um, I think are going to be really well led by a few characteristics. And one of them is the analytics for the strength velocity ratio. So what, that's a big one for our athletes. Doesn't matter whatever the age is, we want to increase the pounds of total arm force relative to the maximum miles per hour that you can throw. Because it should make sense. If you're on a weighted ball program, it's high intensity throwing running guns. If your strength is going down and your velocity is going up, there's only one thing that is making that happen, and that's range of motion. You're pulling back on the catapult. You're stretching tissues more. You're getting more passive interaction of the capsule and some of the other uh, tissues that don't contract to, uh, to promote arm speed. But you're, you're not giving you know, enough force on the opposite end of the catapult to pull it through, and that puts a lot of wear and tear on the hinge, okay, which is your elbow. And, uh, and I'm an elbow special, specialist. I wouldn't say I'm a shoulder specialist. I'd say I'm an, an elbow specialist. Um, but for everybody out there, this is an analytics approach to your training so that you can understand, okay, he's fatigued today. I got a push day today. He's going to do 10 sets of three at these different ball weights. We're going to do janitor throws. We're going to do running guns. And then all of a sudden it's like, huh? You know, this dude's lost 12 pounds of strength in his external rotator cuff. And I'm trying to get this guy to release a ball and decelerate that. And he's running full tilt for 12 feet. It makes you think, is this the right approach to my training now? And for coaches, you don't have the athlete fit your program, okay? Your program fits your athlete. And this is, this is really the easiest way within six minutes to do it, in my opinion. And I know it sounds salesy. Honestly, I'm a scientist. And... Um, I don't get behind anything I don't believe in. There are companies that come to me with products 
I have to test them. I won't put my name on anything. And I believe 100% in this. And, uh, and I can't stop telling people about how important it is. So this is amazing that you have me on, man. What, what I like, what I like about it personally is that there's there's this auto regulatory component to it, where you know a lot of the old school coaches back in the day, like they figured out auto regulation. What does that mean? It means listen to your arm. It means on days that you're dragging, days that you're fatigued, maybe you you back off, you do a little bit less. Um, on days that you feel really really good, maybe you do a little bit more, maybe you do more high higher intensity throws. Um, and there's kind of this intuitive nature that a lot of more experienced throwers and pitchers develop over time. But a lot of younger pitchers don't have that. They don't understand their arm. They throw through soreness. They throw through fatigue. They throw through uh, pain at times. And so as a coach, like maybe the goal is that they can start to learn their arms and some of that intuitive nature develops, but we can't just purely rely on that. So now what I like as a coach, like getting some of our athletes to fully adopt this and using with anybody who comes in-house is we can now empower them and empower the coaches to have data for the auto regulation side of it. So if they test super weak, sure, that initial baseline test, if they're testing super weak, we had a, a pitcher for the Cardinals come in, big league pitcher, um, and he's testing like 20 pounds of force on his external rotator, 20 pounds IR, and he throws 95. And so it's like, okay, wow, this initial baseline, like he's testing very, very weak relative to how hard he's throwing. Right. We have some work to do. But then from, from there on out, now every single check-in is like we can see not only the progress, but we can also see the relative level of fatigue. Like, okay, we've gotten him from 20 pounds to 25 pounds to 30 pounds to 35 pounds. Oh, crap, today now he's back to 26 pounds. He says he's tired. He feels sore. Maybe we don't do velocity training, velocity testing that day. Maybe we skip it this day, come back 72 hours later. So it now gives the coach those tools to enforce auto regulation without totally relying on the athlete to just report, oh, I feel good. Oh, I don't feel as good. Um, and it becomes a lot more subjective if you kind yeah. of handle it in the old school way. So it's it's giving the coaches it's again very very simple it's like it's four tests you're testing external rotation isometric strength internal rotation isometric strength scaption strength and then pinch grip strength it takes two minutes to do and now you have at least this way to auto regulate and monitor over time progress but also fatigue levels for me that's that was like the selling point the fact that yeah. you know we're now empowered to up or down regulate what they do based on those numbers yeah it's a it's a, it's a challenge man um and maybe people don't know what auto regulation is. It's it's when the athlete uses data and really shows you where they're at on that day. I mean, we did this with velocity based training with the angels is like, you know, we had, um, you know, a player that might be doing 50% of their body weight on a bar and we're looking at a velocity profile. And then, you know, the next day, you know, we want to do a ballistic action with them and their velocities go down, you know? So that means like, okay, well, we're not in that velocity range. We have to, they're, we need to auto regulate them and reduce our loading so that they maintain that speed. One of the challenges in baseball, and I mean, you played, you know, at a high level, Ben, that when you have a catch partner and one athlete, you know, is not feeling good, they're hanging, they, you know, they're, they, and their other partner is feeling great. There's an issue there in terms of unmatched training need. You know, mm -hmm. the guy that's hanging, you know, it's almost like, oh, dude, I want to go out to 250. And the other guy's like, oh man, I, I, I don't think I can today. It's, it, it's, my arm's really sore and you know, it's stiff. Can we stay inside 90? And all of a sudden you take that guy who needs that high training level um, and you under train him, right? Or you do the opposite thing. It's like, hey, we're buddies, you and me, Ben. It's like, yeah, I'll take one for the team. And you start putting more effort into an arm that's not good. Um, and at least this gives you some some interpretation of where guys are at. And I'd say if I was a coach, I'd be like, all right, you know, my relievers are throwing together right now. This guy's going in the game. This guy's not going in the game based on this data. And I'm going to tell them, hey, you two guys match up. I need you to throw today. Right. You know, we're not talking about shutting down throwing. We're just saying we need you to throw today, but you guys are going to have a tapered approach. And then you move the other guy. It's like, he's, he's getting ready for the game. He wants to you know, arm feels great. You match them with another guy that's a, a probable. And uh, and now they're getting the work they need. And they're not mismatching. You know, that's kind of how I would use it, I think, as a pitching coach. Yeah, and that that, that did happen, you know, through pro ball, through through college. Like, that that would sometimes happen just organically. Like, the guy who's hanging just, like, throw somebody else. I can't I can't do it today. Um, so that does happen, but I, I can see that would be a conflict 
that sometimes like you know the incentives aren't necessarily aligned on, on a given day with with catch play regarding velocity gain everyone out here is trying to gain velocity a lot of guys listening to this right now are probably on velocity programs of some sort whether they're you know through us or through you know their own velocity program through their team uh do you believe that all velocity gain is equal? Would we rather get it from mechanical efficiency? Would we rather get it from strength training? Would you rather get it from just pushing intensity in a velocity program? All things are not equal. As I mentioned before with the catapult analogy is that if it's a weighted ball only approach and you're not seeing strength improvement, you're getting that from elasticity. So you're getting, you're getting that from angular speed, rotation of your torso, rotation of your pelvis, uh, angular velocity of knee extension, um, and especially internal rotation, angular velocity and elbow extension, angular velocity, those things are contributing to your ball velocity. But the main event is that it's happening from a huge plyometric response at the shoulder. And that's coming from, you know, laxity, essentially, you know, you put a weighted ball in someone's hand, a heavy ball, right? So I see this all the time. Guy has a lot of layback and even in passive range of motion. And then they do a lot of heavy ball training, which is really going to expand range of motion. And again, now here's the catapult pulled back, the elbows, the hinge, you're taking it back further, you're opening up the hinge more, and the muscles to support that hinge um, and stabilize the arm position are messed. So, so that's one way. Weighted ball only, that's a problem, especially if unmonitored with strength. Now, the other element is like you're talking about the strength programming. And for me, you got to start from the inside out. 80% of velocity is occurring in the torso and pelvis region, your core. Okay, 80%. You chop the legs off. They've done studies with guys throwing on two knees. 80% of the velocity can be achieved within those segments. So, you know, if you don't have a very good core process and, uh, and, and you're able to decelerate that rotation abruptly, you're not going to transfer energy as well to the throwing arm. So that's a problem. Okay. Um, the other is, you know, when you go to the extremes, right, we have to be strong from the fingertips to our shoulder. And we also have to be strong from the ground to our pelvis, right? And these are the proximal areas, right? 80% is in the middle of the body. And uh, I see a lot of problems in weight training when it's heavily force generated and there's not a power perspective. And, and I think kids, you know, I mean, I look at my son and he's three years old. He jumps everything. He jumps off of couches. He jumps, you know, uh, playground equipment, you know, they're getting, he's getting, you know, really high elastic loading. And then somehow that changes. We go and progress in our athletic career. And, um, it's all of a sudden it's like, Oh, you got to squat 1.5 times your body weight or two times your body weight to be able to do, you know, some of that shock training. But, you know, the athlete has to have power that component is huge because that gets, that's another way in which you're transferring, um, you, you know, this energy throughout the body. So, so those, that's a big deal, you know, and to put it together, um, those elements can really be effective. Now we created this throw fuzz checklist because we don't want somebody to be not ready or not prepared for a weighted ball program, but we also don't want them to have uh, short lasting effects or injury. So you have to look at, you know, what are the physical metrics going in, you know, maximize those. And especially when the athlete gets to an orthopedic age that, you know, weighted ball training makes sense. But how do you maximize all the things around the weighted ball first? And then now when those things are really good, then you get into the weighted ball training and you, you're focusing on that high level strength and your strength velocity ratio is high. Your pounds per miles per hour is high. and uh, you're going to have retained effects. You're going to have really strong kinetic chain transfer of force from the ground to the fingertip. And you got a higher chance of sustaining it and, and staying healthy. So I, I believe like a combination of it all, but it has to be staged. You know, if you're a 14 year old kid and your inner elbow is still immature, which in a normal person, um, your inner elbow actually becomes fully mature at 17. You want to maximize the strength component because you have to stabilize these growth plates that are that are moving apart. You know, I try to give the analogy to people. It's like imagine, you know, your ligaments and your tendons are a bridge between two uh, pieces of land and those pieces of land are moving away from each other. Well, it's putting tension on the bridge. If you don't have reinforcement over the bridge, 
um, you know, let's just say the bridge is, is wire, but it's not covered by concrete, it's, it's going to damage. So, you know, the, I, I say just maximize the strength, man, early on developmentally. Awesome. Yeah. We, and we, we kind of take the same approach where we tell guys like almost anyone can, can go on some sort of like really max intensity weight of all program and just grunt their way to a two or three mile an hour gain without getting stronger, without actually addressing underlying mechanical deficiencies, without addressing their shoulder strength. Like almost anybody who hasn't done that before has two, three, four, five miles an hour just from the intensity side of the equation. Right. right. We, we describe it to guys as like, that's the icing on the cake. At any point, like if we just push intensity, slapping each other's backs and like smelling salt, like if we, like that's not how you throw hundred miles an hour or 95 miles an hour consistently, but that right. is potentially how you squeeze out that last little bit of toothpaste out of the tube. But what are the, what are the foundational pieces that are actually going to stick with you for an entire season? you know, raise the floor velocity level versus just trying to squeeze out a little bit more of peak velocity from your existing patterns, your existing strength levels. So it's like these 140 pound kids, you know, think they need a weighted ball program. Well, maybe you need to weigh 185 pounds and have a strong shoulder, have a strong core, you know, hit some of these base strength metrics and stop flying open, I don't know, 20 degrees too early, um, address these things first. And then the intensity is going to be there. Then we can we can always push intensity for a six week, you know, weighted ball program. Um, but some of these programs out there are just so at least the ones I've seen are like so irresponsible in terms of the volumes, in terms of the the number of throws. I mean, two ounce to two pound balls, you know, three, four, five pull five pull downs of each three days a week. Like there's just been there's some extremely irresponsible programs out there. And I like that you guys have created this this checklist. I mean different coaches can kind of modify what the exact numbers they want to see are. But the idea of having a checklist and, you know, a high school coach doesn't need every single pitcher on that list to, to go do a weighted ball program for them to all come out of the off season throwing harder. Maybe some guys need to gain 20 pounds, get stronger. Maybe other guys need to improve their mechanics. And maybe some guys are already strong, already have decent mechanical guardrails and it's time to push that intensity. So yep. I think just having that conversation is like there's different ways to get to the same endpoint, and some guys are not quite ready for that. And that might be the final step in the development process versus a lot of people want that like quick fix now. Like I need to throw five miles an hour harder six weeks from now versus looking at it on a longer time frame. Like, yeah. hey, we've got, I'm a freshman in high school. I got four years. I got three years. They think they need to be committed now at age 14. It's like, what's, what's the ultimate goal, right? What's the ultimate goal? Is it a six week time frame? Is it a two-year time frame? Is it a four-year time frame? Is it an eight-year time frame? And it starts to change how you approach the entire process when you lengthen out that time frame. Yeah, I mean, you're you're hitting these things on the head. I, I can I dive a little deeper in physics or no? Hundred percent. Yeah. Okay. So so you know some of the things you're talking about are things that I've been exploring since my PhD years, and I believe that every single pitcher has a momentum relationship. And for people that don't know momentum, it's mass times velocity. OK. And, um, you know, you're talking about, you know, some athletes need body size improvement. And I agree. And, uh, and but the combination is how does the mass improvement affect the velocity potential of how the body moves? Right. And so if you have a program that increases hypertrophy for an athlete, that's one element where they need it um, for a fast athlete. Let's say let's just say you're looking at 3D motion capture. The guy has really high, high velocities, super high arm speed, um, not coming out with a, a lot of velo. Um, you know, the mass factor for that player might be more important. You know, there's an athlete that, um, you know, is close to me, a family friend, his kid's a hundred, this kid's 150 pounds and he throws 89. Okay. If he gains 20 pounds, he might throw 91 or 92. Okay. Cause he's, he's got that mass element that's being mm -hmm. involved in this equation. And, and, and also on the opposite spectrum with the big players that you're not getting a lot out of, you know, the body speed element is also important. So, you know, when you talk about training and you're putting them on a spectrum of programming, that's why I like velocity based tools, especially with an athlete that's got, you know, great technique and, and uh, movement literacy. It's like, OK, dude, we don't need to do anything over 65 percent of your maximum force capacity. You need more velocity driven uh, performance. That was one player. Um, oh, man, Jeremy Rhodes. 
uh, with the Angels. If you guys have ever seen this guy, he made it up to AAA. He, he, he struggled for a long time. His body was like an NFL tight end, chiseled pitcher. He should have been a third baseman. He was just ripped. Um, guy could jump, you know, it didn't make sense. He, he could jump almost 40 inches, um, extremely powerful. He could squat, he could front squat close to 500 pounds. Okay. There was diminished returns there because his momentum relationship was altered. He was high mass, low velo. So all of a sudden, you know, we changed the training component. And so I talk about this strength and coordination it doesn't have to look like pitching, but it's got to follow along. What does he need on the field? And we say, okay, you're doing under 65%. We're going to focus more on single leg work and you're going to move it quickly. And he went from like 91, he was in a weighted ball program and he, he got 93 and then suffered. And then he said, okay, I, I, I'm going to get away from this like high grind, um, slow lifting, you know, element. And he's a triple A guy. So we gave him a little bit more leeway, you know, they're experienced and he's an experienced lifter. He's the best lifter we had in an organization. He could have been a strength coach in, if he wanted to. And, uh, and then we started seeing 95s, 96s, 97s, no weighted balls. Just the, mo the momentum equation was improved. The other thing that we had seen is that athletes who are large that can't jump is a problem. You know, so jump power is important. And any you don't need a force plate. We use jump mats. You can use a Sayers formula. Use the peak power formula and identify what kind of wattage your athlete puts out on a vertical jump. And, um, you know, that's really important too, because if the athlete can squeeze out a thousand watts, so that means there's an intersection between the jump height and the body weight. You know, if they gain, if they're a heavy guy and they gain a little bit on their jump, a couple inches, and, and they can get a thousand watts increase, you know, or, you know, you want to get them over 7,000 watts, but you can get them there. You're going to see a mile per hour bump. It's not a big return, but it's part of the equation, right? Um, so, you know, those kind of elements, I think, are, you know, impactful to, to the overall equation of getting, you know, guys to throw hard and, and appreciating the physics, right? This mass velocity perspective, because jump power is really like force times velocity, and you're using mass in the equation to, to calculate um, a regression or a prediction of their power. But when you can do that, now you're starting to do some strength and coordination training. You're starting to understand, you know, what's needed. And then you got to look at, you know, a lot of force plate testing and uh, even jump mat testing is bilateral. They're jumping with two legs, right? In the instance of throwing, that back foot is on the ground for a minuscule piece of time. Some of them drag, but it gets picked up. Um, you're not applying a lot of force with two feet in the ground ever. But you'll notice some of your pitchers are highly bilateral. OK, so now your program has to change even more. Here's the strength and coordination approach. And you got to say, all right, this guy is bilateral bias. OK, and now when I'm looking at his unilateral power metrics, they're not very good. Right. Does it make sense with this athlete to keep squatting them and keep doing um, various forms of deadlifting? When they're good there. Right. So, and then you go into, you know, you could use another test called the dynamic strength index where you're looking at jump power to isometric mid-thigh pull. Then you're looking to see what kind of capability in terms of the max force does this athlete have versus this, his, uh, it, it, his power potential. And now you're able to take, like that guy, Jeremy, uh, he would have blown, you know, he would have blown the, the isometric mid-thigh pull out of the water. He would have probably ripped the thing. He would have busted the... The, the rails of pulling the bar into them, but, um, and he could jump, you know, but I think the combination, the relationship would say, Hey, we need more velocity work out of this guy. Um, and it, and it helps, you know, it helps, you know, and that's kind of taking your world, uh, and just giving a little bit more of a physics application to it and, and using data. You know, I think that's another topic of this is like coaches are afraid to use data. And I think part of the reason is that the education process is not there yet. That's one of the reasons why we're building a certified pitching biomechanics course that's got the understanding to make that relationship. It's going to be out in 2023 to connect the dots from data into these strength and coordination programs so that the athlete is getting a better on-field transfer of training. One interesting kind of 
case study here is this pitcher Robert Stock, who I've known for I've known for years. He threw 100 miles an hour at 200 pounds, and then he gained a bunch of weight over like 2020, I believe. And he threw 100 miles an hour at 255, 260, somewhere in there. He got he got fat, but was still throwing 100. And it's it's really interesting to watch how he threw 100 both ways because kind of the underlying mechanics are similar. But the amount of arm speed he had at 200, 205 pounds, his arm moves so much quicker than it did at 255, 260. But in both cases, he threw 100. So you're yeah. starting to realize, like, okay, there is, there's this momentum thing where, like, he can kind of compensate by having more mass, slower arm speed, or when he's a little bit leaner, higher velocity, lower mass. In both yep. cases, he's able to produce 100 miles an hour. And yep. so now, there, now there's definitely trade-offs. Like, if, if he weighed 150 pounds, like... Okay, certainly doesn't wouldn't have have the mass to throw 100 miles an hour. Although he threw 95 at 15 years old, um, but if he gave you weight 300 pounds, like now there's a trade off there. He's not going to be able to move as athletically. His his velocity is going to drop uh, as far as like how fast he can move. So we'd like to tell guys like there is a sweet spot in there. There's a sweet spot for what body fat percentage where it's it's advantageous. How much lean body mass where it's advantageous versus where it starts to be counterproductive. When I was at the Orioles. I had a chance to work with Dontrell Willis, and he's a seriously funny guy. He's a super nice guy. Um, but we got him. If you look at the decline of his performance, it really correlated with his body mass changes. So, you know, and he actually communicated about this is that teams were constantly attacking him for his body fat percentage. You know, um, I was never, I, I'm glad I met him because it got rid of this kind of fat shaming approach. Hey man, you got to get to like 11%. Like what is this 17% body fat you have? And um, it made sense because he said, you know, I just, there's a couple things. He's like, Ryan, I just don't feel like I have stamina. And, you know, I, I just don't feel like my body motion is the same, you know? And, and this is interesting because this is like a constraint led approach communication like in the motor learning you know option you can alter the task you can alter the environment to create a different motor pattern or skill but you can also alter the organism the person and he altered that part of him and it it reconstructed his motor programming approach to throwing and then you know his velocity wasn't there and he really struggled it was really hard to work with a player that, you know, I watched him with the Marlins. And I was like, man, this guy was crazy. Huge leg kick, you know, thunder coming out of the arm, you know, scary. And then, you know, there are guys that wouldn't be afraid to take the ball off the teeth out of this big, big guy who lost a lot of mass. He looked good. He did not pitch well. And um, in, in, in that anthropometric element is it's really, it's really an important feature. You know, and people like players and you do it. I love when you had were on our podcast. First time I heard a pitching coach or specialist in any regard really talk about dialing in a player's nutrition. You know, like the, that's one thing I really like about Tread, um, you know, that you, you know, and other other big programs is that they're not just coming for skill. They're not just coming in for strength, but the competitive habits of how they are nourishing their bodies is key. You know, and in a lot of guys like, you know, this young man that we work with, um, you know, Jordan with our company has been working with him and he's just, you know, going from 76, no weighted balls to 89 at 150 pounds. It's all strength generated. But the challenges is like, you know, the kid needs to cook with coconut oil, you know, an avocado oil. He just needs more fat, more calories. Right. And um, and that element is a secret weapon, man. Because we're talking about it right now. You talk to players, you know, you want to perform better. Well, you got to eat better. You got to sleep better. You have to do the recovery work that's necessary. You need a better psychological place for your mind. And, uh, you know, we, we boil it down to the physics of it. You know, the momentum, we're talking about that mass times velocity or the jump power, which you need that leg power is the intersection of mass and jump height. You sacrifice those things you know, and, and you're in trouble, you know, you really are. hundred percent. I, I think it's interesting how some pitchers do perform better when they're a little bit leaner and others perform better when like we, we've seen both sides of the spectrum, right? We've seen the, we've seen the guys that were a little bit higher body fat. We lean them out. 
do it responsibly without losing strength, you know, slight calorie deficit. And now suddenly they're getting into better positions on the mound. They can get into their back leg. They can move a little bit quicker and their velo takes up. And then you also see the examples like Dontra Willis where big guy, maybe he lose, lost weight too fast. And I know CeCe Sabathia tried to lose 40 pounds one year, you know, probably didn't do it the right way, uh, but came yeah. back throwing slower as well. So I, I don't know the intricate details of why some of those failed uh, body comp approaches you know, happened, but you know, some guys just feel better at 20% body fat. And some guys can't move at 20% body fat. I've got a couple right. big leaguers right now who, you know, they're in the 250 plus range. And like when they threw their absolute best in their careers, they were in the 235, 240 range. And so like yeah. for them, that's, that's a goal is to lean them out. And then there's guys who, you know, they're 170 pounds and like at 190, they would almost certainly throw better, but you don't really know, I guess is my point until you kind of, you kind of experiment through that range of body fats. Like you build the strength, you build the power. But then once that's built, once they can do all these, you know, squat, lunge, you know, jump, once they can hit these metrics, figuring out at what body fat level they actually feel and perform the best. Yeah, I mean, it, it, you know, when it comes to lean mass, too, I mean, we're talking body fat and body composition. Um, at Louisiana Tech, where we're doing research, we found that the body fat composition did not correlate as well to velocity as the lean mass. And it kind of makes sense. So like body fat is in hydrous. There's no water in it, really. Um, and it just kind of, it doesn't contract. So it doesn't really add to power. It adds some momentum. But when you think about it, like I think about going into front foot contact because you, you're storing all this energy in the mass and then you're hitting the ground. Like imagine when we talk about body fat and we're talking about, um, you know, uh, uh, lean mass. Imagine I took a 40 pound weight dumbbell in my hand and I just dropped it on the grass, right? That's solid. It's going to have really hard impact into the grass. You know, it's, it's, it's got, it, it's probably got way more momentum um, because the gravity effects of that mass is going to be increased. But now imagine I took like a um, 40 pounds of maybe foam, you know, which is fat, you know, and I dropped it, right? The impact is going to be soft. It doesn't contract. It's not solid. And, um, and that's where I think the body composition thing is really important. You talked about set point weight, which is, I see that with great athletes. They're just consistent with their body weight. Um, and, and over time, like Mike Trout, 242 every single year, at least when I was with the angels and, um, you know, he, he's lucky cause he's got some great genetics on his side. He has a great training process. And he's, he's become more careful with his diet and he's understood that, you know, you see players decline. I think one of the studies I read is that players hit their peak performance at 29, at the age of 29. Um, and there's other studies that you could connect the dots that players gain body fat after the age of 29. Right. Um, and it makes sense where our testosterone levels go down. You know, I test my, I, I take blood work to check those testosterone levels. I never want to take steroids. But I want to be able to understand what is the diet that I need to increase my free testosterone levels. So that goes down now. And there's also been studies show, okay, well, if testosterone is going down, it impacts muscle contraction and also elasticity. So now it impacts the jump. And so around the age of 29 years old, athletes are getting fatter um, and they're not jumping as well. Right. So, you know, having the set point, I think, is... Um, is huge maintaining the weight, you know, trying to ensure that you know most of your mass is lean, um, and and also you know for good health. I mean, man, like the diet's so important. You want to be healthy. I mean, forget baseball. You don't want to die of cancer. You don't want to have a stroke. You don't want to have a heart attack. Um, you know, simple things like you drink coffee. Don't put cream in it. Have black coffee. You want to wake up. Why why have extra? Ca especially if it's sugary. You don't need it. Um, so making good choices, even for just overall health, is huge. I mean, we're talking about mass, but also that's a port part of recovery. You know, that's your first recovery defense. Is like when I people I look at their arm strength, and I notice when we look at their fresh exam, and, and they keep showing deficits. They keep having a colored box over where their strength um, is that it hasn't regained. They don't bounce back well. First thing I ask them, what's your your caloric intake like? What are you eating? And, and then how are you sleeping? 
you know, because um, they don't sleep well, their cortisol levels are high. And, um, you know, it impacts recovery. Yeah, 100%. That, that, that highlights the need to be able to evaluate kind of holistically what an athlete is doing to understand what they need. You mentioned like not a lot of places do take nutrition as seriously as we do. Well, it's because we like we know that's a piece of the puzzle. We know if, if we're going to give them strength training, for them to actually get everything out of that strength training, they need to recover because the strength training is just the stimulus. And what are you doing to recover? That's the nutrition. That's the sleep. That's everything else. You know, if we spend all this time working on mechanics, but now they can't actually perform in a game, well, we need to address the mental side because they're not going to actually be able to go have success in season if we don't address the mental side. Like all these things matter. If we don't address the injury side, the movement quality, every single piece matters. And so we need to be able to address and evaluate athletes within that kind of bird's eye view paradigm. And from there, figure out where are you deficient? Like our, yeah. our intake questionnaire is like, I mean, it's probably a hundred questions long. We, we need to know a lot of information to be able to spot those deficiencies. If they say my, my breakfast is a bowl of cereal and then I don't eat till 8 p.m. and I can't gain weight, like we, we can start to piece the dots together if you have that holistic view of what they're doing. That's the main reason that we approach training from that standpoint, that perspective. We want data, um, but we also want to be able to look at it from kind of that bird's eye view to see what's the lowest hanging fruit for this guy? Is it arm strength or is he good there? Is it nutrition? Is he good there? Is it, hey, he's dialed in all these factors, but his mental game is weak. He crumbles under pressure. Like we need to know what are the main things that we can get the most, how can we give this guy the most value? And it's usually not like just do everything. There's usually some pretty obvious deficiencies and limiting factors and we can place the focus there. It's, it's amazing. I mean, for, for people who have the, the money, I would get a full blood panel. I was amazed. You know, some of the places that I wasn't good in um, from DHEA to free testosterone. I, I had great total test or testosterone. I needed better free testosterone. A lot of the things that was communicated to me, triglyceride levels relative to uh, other ratios, insulin. You know, you, you want to be competitive in everything you do. And your body is your business, man. Like if the body is bad, you know, business it's not going to be very good. What's your take on like pitchers who are already very lax? Um, mm -hmm. Do we have a greater need for shoulder strength, a greater need for strength training? If we're dealing with pitchers who already have a lot of range of motion, uh, do we need to avoid, you know, certain types of weighted balls? Um, like, how do you approach that idea of like laxity versus injury risk versus the type of training that those those athletes need to do? Yeah, laxity is a problem. Um, it, it, it really is. And if you had a camera and you could look down on athletes, you know, the first place I look is like how much uh, dual horizontal abduction do they have? Like in terms of elbows going back, um, you know, some guys get close to very, to like, you know, I call them like elbow touchers. They, they get very close together um, behind them. And that first tells me, okay, well, the anterior side of the shoulder needs a lot more training. Right. So that's somebody that's like, OK, and you look at these programs and you test all these pro athletes, man, they're heavy posterior side. OK, they're not very strong in internal rotation or the muscles that contribute to them. So I know, OK, well, this particular athlete is going to need uh, pec flies, you know, getting back to the strength and coordination element. It's like, OK, you know, that's the action that he goes back behind his body. He needs to have the stability to be able to handle that those muscles are going to get stretched. Those passive tissues are going to get stretched and you could have anterior shoulder problems. So that's, that's one of the things. The other thing when they're really lax and they're in that position, typically the humeral head, it translates, you know, higher up in the, uh, in the glenoid fossa or the shoulder capsule and joint, they, they, there's a shift. Okay. So there's some loosening in the capsule. The shoulder head can move upward and backward. And now they have not only extreme horizontal abduction, meaning my arm's going back, but now they get more layback, right? So now the arm hangs back but further behind the body out of the scapular plane. And now because I've, I've altered that position of the humeral head and I've given myself a more um, position that's upward and behind me, I can get more layback. One of the issues that happens there with the lax pitcher, there's twofold. The slap tears they happen and we go over this in our certified arm care specialist course so it'll be much easier to see but they happen as a peel back mechanism so if you imagine i took a rubber band and i just twisted them up between my fingers right i'm creating a lot of tension that's torsion 
um, on the attachment points, you'll feel like your fingers start getting pulled, right? That's your bicep tendon. So now that you have a lot of laxity, laxity arms uh, upward and back, it's further behind you, you're externally rotating more, you put a lot more stress on the labrum because of the, the long head of the, the bicep tendon, which is originates from there, um, is rolled up. So again, okay, well, we got to know that the bicep is a secondary stabilizer and external rotation, especially for that athlete. That athlete is going to use their bicep to be able to control their position of external rotation as a secondary stabilizer. Now, like I told you, the posterior strength of that pitcher, especially a pro, um, is heavily behind them. You know, 90% of the programs is 90% external rotation and back of the body. And now they have weak internal rotators. Well, the internal rotators are the only things that can put the brakes on for external rotation. And they're the only muscles that can support the load that the bicep has to see. So it shields the bicep tendon from having to handle all that stress, right? So now, you know, I know in that program, that hyperlax guy, I got to have an internal rotation focus of some level, okay? Um, the other thing that people don't realize about hyperlax pitchers is they can also have less blood supply in their throwing arm. So when the humeral head has a chance to move around, especially like um, creating shoulder clearance and external rotation, the humeral head can actually compress the uh, axillary um, blood supply. You know, so tingling in the fingertips and stuff, they're, they're basic, you know, signals of TOS. But the hyperlaxity, the hypermobile shoulder can actually pinch off circulation. So then you have to go to a dietary approach. And for that kind of pitcher, you're also looking at, can I increase my nitric oxide level through my diet to increase the dilation to the, to the muscles in my throwing arm? Because I know because of my laxity, I'm going to have less blood supply. So if you have less blood supply and you're looking at certain ligaments and tendons, which are really almost avascular. They don't have a ton of blood. Um, you're putting yourself at risk for significant injury, even down chain, um, like your elbow. So, you know, the hyperlaxity is an issue. And biomechanically, when we look in 3D motion capture, um, and what I looked in my research is that if you have an athlete that's got really fast upper torso rotation, and you look at this in 3D, and they have significant laxity, they're going to have a lot of arm leg. And if they don't time up that rotation well with their arm position, if the momentum of the trunk is altered relative to the momentum of the arm, and that's why you need to capture this, it's going to increase load to the elbow. That increases load to the elbow um, because there's that, that leg effect. You're, you're creating more bending um, at the elbow joint because you got this fast rotation, your arm's laying back, and it's like a, it's like a whip. I'm like, Boom, I'm trying to pull it and it's going away from the center of rotation. It's way out here and it's got to come back. It's definitely a double edged sword, right? Because on the one hand, like external rotation, layback is a, and being able to get into that horizontal abduction position, the scapulated position, like that is a piece of what a lot of hard throwers do to be able to apply force to the ball over a longer range of motion, right? The, the Ronald Chapmans of the world who can get super far back, they're creating crazy amounts of layback. Um, mm -hmm. They're able to apply force to the ball over long range of motion. If they're also strong, they have now that strength and that length component that you talk about. They're applying over long range of motion and they're applying a lot of force now over that long range of motion. Ben Joyce, like these guys who have the, have laxity, but at the same time have strength. Uh, there's like there's almost like an increased potential for velocity, but there's also that increased potential for injury. Their joints are literally looser. Their ligaments yeah. are literally looser. They have more space there. They have more gapping, more play in their elbow joint. Um, so it just, for me, it highlights the need of, of why strength is even more important for those guys. Stability is more important. Training internal rotation and external rotation, more important. Making sure the flexors are strong, even more important for those guys. Um, but the ceiling is also potentially higher, assuming it's not just like excessive, excessive, excessive laxity. So yep. it's like, Hey, you've been blessed and cursed at the same time. Yeah. I mean, one of the metrics to really pay attention to is the um, ERI or ratio, external rotation strength uh, relative to the internal rotation strength. And we have a range of 0.85 to 1.05. So if the external rotator cuff doesn't meet 85% of the strength of the internal rotation strength, that changes the program, right? To balance that out, 
we we want to get to one to one. Now you'll find with a lot of pro athletes because they've done a lot of arm care training and a lot of it's posterior dominant. They're going to be on the opposite side of the spectrum. Their ER is going to be much stronger than their IR. Okay. And they're going to be above that 1.05. Some of them are going to be like 1.2. I've seen some as high as 1.4. They're, they're, they're 40% stronger in layback than they are in the acceleration muscles. And it's really no surprise to me when I see that, that those, those pitchers, um, if you look at their velocity records, they, um, they really have a big drop off after the second or third inning. You know, they can't really compete at the same level deeper into the game. You know, and now with the arm care unit, um, you can not only look at that that combination of strength, but you can look at the post throwing and really understand what's the fatigability of the accelerators, right? And make the connection there. You know, so we talk about health, but there's also a performance driven aspect um, of strength. You know, and I always say it. I mean, the heuristic I use all the time is strength matters most. I mean, we're talking about. You know, I'm talking about biomechanics. I'm talking all these things, but look at man, like what you said, everybody has a different anatomy, injury history, and ability. And if they're strong, they can support and shield loads away from areas that are sensitive. You know, and support those, that that hypermobility, that strength and length continuum. If length starts beating strength, you know, it's a rubber band. It starts getting thinner. It's not a thick rubber band. Um, you know, that you're stretching, it's got a higher opportunity of snapping. So I think, I think a lot of people can relate to this idea of, of your shoulder has, you know, muscles on the front and the back, and you want those to be balanced, right? That intuitively makes sense. People understand that. What are the injuries you see when someone's lacking in internal rotation strength? Is it more bicep tendon stuff, subscap strains, uh, just velocity decline um, versus the guy who has super strong accelerators, but no decelerators? Is that more rotator cuff? Uh, you know, supraspinatus and infraspinatus uh, type issues. How do those, how do the injuries that you might expect play out depending on where that imbalance is occurring? Yeah. So you, you kind of nailed the head, nailed it on the head with the, with the imbalances of, of IR, you know, especially, especially for the, um, um, the layback slap. Okay. It's like doing the, the torsion. Now there's another element in the delivery where you have a traction force um, on the bicep in follow through well towards ball release and you you can actually get pulling of the labrum there too yeah. and that's so where that's the, where you got yeah, after ball yeah. release your arm is literally being like pulled off right. your body and the bicep so there, is getting pulled this way right right yeah. so you, you need to you need to have the posterior strength to be able to support that you know posterior rotator rotator cuff strains a lot of athletes that i see that have um um extensor uh injuries forearm extensor injuries like tennis elbow first place I would look is like, what's their external rotation strength? Because there's some element of deceleration that they're using of their flexors after, or their extensors after um, ball release that the back of the shoulder isn't working well with. But when it comes to elbows, you know, like people are like, oh man, there's a huge elbow injury epidemic. I'm like, well, you take a look at their ERI or ratio. And most of these guys are going to be way far the pendulum into external rotation you know your arms a catapult elbows the hinge now imagine this is the thing is you take an athlete super laxy lax uh, shoulder and um you put a you put a heavy ball in their hand and the heavy ball pushes them even to more uh external rotation right but then you give them a light ball and they might do like a reverse throw with a light ball. Now you're now you're taking the catapult back. You're accelerating the cal- catapult back at a super high rate, higher than the, what they ever use when they throw. There's no legs. It's just completely just dis- the only way you're decelerating this ball is through your anterior core. It's not even your shoulder. And then, you know, in the training and now extrapolate that to throwing and you're increasing layback speed. Well, you got greater range, your layback speed's increasing, and you got an elbow hinge, and your internally rotator, your internal rotators are weak, and you combine with pinch grip strength weakness, now you blow out elbows. So the thing is, is like it, it's all a combination. It's like I, I look at it like synth- synthesizing music. You gotta put up the dials here, you gotta drive down the dials there. And we constant we we have to constantly be adaptable 
and, and understand the changing conditions of the athlete's throwing arm to keep them healthy, you know, and to, and to really understand how those, those imbalances all over the place um, need to be fixed. And fundamentally it comes down to, we want to be strong head to toe, right? Every, any, any weak link in that entire chain, whether it's IR strength, whether it's ER strength, whether it's flexor strength, whether it's anterior core strength, whether it's lower body strength. I think that's the general theme we keep coming back to is like, we want to be strong head to toe. If we are, we also want to be, you know, powerful as well, head to toe. We want to move efficiently and we want to have the data on hand to up or down regulate those dials and that intensity and the throwing volume uh, when we need to. Um, so I think hopefully, you know, we, I know we've dug, dug into the weeds a little bit here, but hopefully like people get that big takeaway, you know, let's, tr let's prepare our bodies well, let's recover well, let's dial in everything we possibly can. And then let's, you know, once you've done that hard work, now you can go compete on the field and, you know, know that your body has been as prepared as you possibly can. How do you view the, the place of mechanics? Like, do you, do you look at mechanics where it's like, you know, however they throw is just how they throw, let's get them strong. And do, you know, that'll do the best we can within the, their patterns. Um, you know, if you see something like a major inverted W, like, is that a risk factor where you, you would address certain mechanical red flags from an injury standpoint? Or do you think, you know, first things first, get them strong. And then from there, let's look at what mechanical factors might also be predisposing them to injury. But we have to have a roadmap of when to make a mechanical change. So for example, what would happen in pro baseball at the beginning, um, before we develop the process is that it would just be visual. You know, we're looking at slow motion camera and we'd be like, okay, this guy's got late arm timing. And, um, you know, we got to go in there and we got to change it. We got to speed him up. Uh, we got to shorten his arm path and we got to get, make sure that it is, he's, he's flipped up at, at foot contact. So, you know, one of the risks with that is that we created a lot of injuries because it changed a lot about the motor preference of the athlete. They had timing. Like, for example, you take an athlete that's quad dominant. That means like when they load going down the mound, their knee goes closer to their toe. One of the things to counterbalance that is almost like a stab position. You'll see this all the time. A lot of guys that are knee dominant, they go towards the toe, the ball faces behind them, right? And now you haven't changed the knee dominant pattern. And you've tried to change what happens with the ball. And now with the ball, the ball now faces the ground. Okay. And, and, and the scap loads changed and the, the, the patterns changed, right? But you still haven't changed the knee dominant aspect. And then what happens there is that the athlete gets into hip extension, starts pushing in a different direction. And, um, and then all of a sudden they become rotational. We talk about the linear rotational element causes, causes problems. So that's one thing is like, are they performing poorly? If they're not, leave it alone. The second is, do they have pain? If they don't, leave it alone. What you need to do is, you know, when I look at the biomechanics, it doesn't predict injury. It doesn't, 100% doesn't. Um, and what it does is it should give you an understanding of the strength and coordination approach to say, this is how this dude throws. I'm evaluating all these metrics. These are this these strength elements have to be reinforced for this particular delivery because he's not in pain and he's not performing poorly. And uh, and what happens? Our, our GM said it the best, man. And and this is what happened all over our organization. Billy Epler is with the Mets, amazing human being. He said, "We don't want death by the cure," and it happens everywhere when we change a motor preference with an athlete. Sometimes they perform better, sometimes they perform worse, but they are going to go through some ad adjustments potentially in pain. Now, you have pain or you have poor performance, okay? Then it opens the avenue to start to evaluate what could be happening mechanically. But the first step is you wait 72 hours and you test strength. If they don't have strength, it doesn't matter what you do with them mechanically. It's not going to build it back. You still have a weak arm, right? So, you know, we started this thing with the angels. It was amazing. We had a rocket scientist, a legit rocket scientist in our organization. Smartest human being I've ever met. Um, it's almost uncomfortable to talk to him. Uh, and uh, I love that he humbled me time and time again. But we created this biomechanical model 
in drafting. It was extensive, probably had a data set of maybe two or 300 pitchers um, from all the way from high school, all the way. Some of we had Cy Young winners in there. It was the most extensive developmental longitudinal analysis of the pitching delivery that anyone has. Okay. This guy put it in a grinder, major machine learning approach. Um, and, and we had interns, we had a lot of people um, looking and calculating. And this thing was amazing. You hit a button, and it gave you a score. What's your biomechanical score, right? So we started drafting a lot of guys with the clean biomechanics, with the, uh, you know, the arm position at the right position, the weight bearing foot flat, you know, the, the trunk is still closed, like all, all those great, all those great elements that we see in research, right? So it was backed a little bit by evidence. We drafted these kids and this was going on for two years. We had zero pitchers and we would led the league in arm injuries. We led the league in the major league level. We were about, I don't know, 20th or 22nd worst at the minor league level. We had zero pitchers with an inverted W position. None. None of those guys got hurt. All the clean guys, they got hurt. Right? So it changed my perspective is like, what's optimal? What's perfect? What's efficient? You know? And um, I don't buy it. And, and when we started looking into arm strength, and we realized, holy jumping, that it is, it is significant how weak these arms are. And it just completely, like, I'm a biomechanist, and I'm also an exercise physiologist. And I started saying, well, the biomechanics piece is great for performance. We need to utilize it, help the athlete to throw more accurately, and to throw harder. But when it comes to the health, I'm not looking there. You know, I'm looking more at the strength side of things, you know, and I, I, I'm not giving up on biomechanics because I just was, you know, graciously invited and I'm so grateful um, to, to work with ASMI. Dr. Glenn Fleissig is a, a champ and a mentor to me. And we really want to take a perspective as saying, can we identify injury risk in biomechanics? And what's known as any given athlete if you increase velocity by one mile per hour, it doesn't matter if it's you, it's me, you know, my wife, whoever, you are going to increase torque on your elbow by one unit. You are never going to increase velocity in your body and lower your torque. It doesn't happen. This is why strength is so important. Strength matters most because any velocity increase, if it doesn't come with a strength increase, you've already increased loading on your, your elbow joint. But we had to look at this and say, well, can we make them more efficient? And we had to define efficiency and efficiency from a biomechanical lens or a mechanical lens. We call it biomechanical efficiency grading. We have to look at what is the miles per hour to the relative torque on the elbow. Can you do more with less? And that might give us a perspective to appreciate both health and performance in one metric. And that's the same thing as what we're searching with, with uh, armcare.com with the strength velocity ratio. Can we get health and performance in one metric? We know performance is the miles per hour. The health is the pounds of arm force. That's the direction to go. Now, if you have an athlete, no pain, all right, no performance decrement, super high pounds per miles per hour, super high miles per hour to torque, relative torque, it doesn't make sense to me that you would say, well, I'm going to change something because all of a sudden you're going to alter these balances. Arms more fatigue, pounds per miles per hour go down. Okay. Um, velocity goes up, but wait, his torque goes up too, and he loses accuracy, you know, cause then there's Fitz law. This is something too, that I think the community is listening to this need to read into Fitz law is how, um, how velocity and accuracy interchange. When I do things faster, I lose accuracy. You know, if I, let's say I made a tic-tac-toe board and I had a pen and I was going in each square like this. This is the demonstration I give to people when I do private education. You're going in each box, but also I go da -da 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 and I'm trying to I'm trying to hit my pen in those boxes as fast as possible. I'm not going to hit the same like middle part of those boxes. I'm going to lose my accuracy. Right. So. You know, we need to have that component too. And on top of the Fitz law, what people don't realize, and, and I see the strength programming all the time, and I don't mean to like poo-poo on anybody's program, but it's so highly endurance driven 
that it doesn't contribute to Fitt's law velocity and accuracy because you are using a greater percentage of your strength to attain that velocity and you lose motor control. And it should make sense. Anybody in the strength and conditioning world, I squat 225, okay, and that's my max. And uh, I move 150 pounds at a certain velocity, right? But then I take my max 225 and I've now maxed my strength to 370 pounds. And now I use the 150, which is my pitching level of force. It's like a, it's a, it's like a minuscule percentage of my max. You're using less neurological effort, metabolic effort, but yet, you know, we train the global parts of our body or, you know, our, our pecs or back quads, hamstrings, you know, a calves, we put them at a very high level of max force. But then we look at the arm and say, Hmm, this is porcelain. We got to take it easy on this. And that's why I love the armcare.com device, man. Cause it's like, Hey, we test max strength and you know, we're building out further iterations of our training, but we focus on trying to get closer to max strength and max recruitment because we know that velocity accuracy trade-off is going to be much better, less effort to control the ball. And I just think stronger people are harder to kill. And just think about that with your arm. I mentioned that one pitcher who came in, one big league pitcher, and uh, you know, tested super weak, obviously, on internal, external. And unsurprisingly, asked him, like, what does your arm care routine look like? Because it's not like he wasn't doing arm care. And it's, you know, the classic, I don't ever go over five pound dumbbells and I just do like light bands to warm up. And I love that, you know, you take that approach of like, well, we're training our legs to be strong. We're training our, you know, we're not just going to stop at 135 pounds. Like we're going to keep adding five pounds as long as we can. Like we're going to train our upper body to be strong. We're going to train our back to be strong. Like we're going to train everything we can to be strong. Why do we not apply that to the muscles, the connected tissue, everything in our rotator cuff and, you know, anterior shoulder. So you know, if we're training rotator cuff, like why stop at five pounds? Uh, I like, you know, personally, I like the crossover bands in that mm -hmm. there are so many different resistances to, to play with. Like you're never going to outgrow the crossover bands on any movement, except maybe like a, you know, a row or something like that, which you're not going to use that for like your upper body lifting anyway. Um, but yeah, we, we tell guys like we can train the arm heavy. We're still going to progress it slowly, incrementally. Like you're not going to be busting out 25 pound extra rotations day one. Um, right. You know, I personally love doing like seated dumbbell external rotations and getting strong through the entire arc of the range that I have. And, you know, maybe 10 pounds is challenging to start, but pretty soon you'll be doing 15 pounds and eventually you'll be doing 20 pounds. And, you know, how much, how much more resilient to injury are you if you're training that entire arc of motion, you know, 20 pounds, 25 pounds eventually and controlling it the entire range versus the guy who never does over five pounds and just, you know, goes out into competition with, Again, having treated his arm like porcelain. I also just really like that quote that you you mentioned. We don't want death by the cure. I've kind of come to learn this and observe like guys because guys come to us when they're struggling. They don't come to us when things are going great. Like the big leaguer that's, you know, Cy Young winner, like he doesn't come to us then. He comes to us four years later when his velo is down five miles an hour. He can't figure out why. And a lot of times, especially the higher level guys that we see and we try to we we try to Again, understand the entire picture, unwind where did things go wrong. And sometimes it's just, you know, injury compensation. Uh, sometimes it's they got away from, you know, long toss or whatever they did in high school to throw hard and they just haven't done that now in five, six, seven years. Um, but sometimes it is mechanical changes, well-intentioned mechanical changes by a coach who is qualified um, but didn't necessarily understand the, the complexities and the interrelatedness. And you change one little thing here, you change his... You know, you have a guy who doesn't necessarily sit as much in his back leg. You try to get him to sit into his back leg, but not realizing now that changes his arm action timing. Now that changes his trunk timing. It has so many unintended ripples through the entire kinetic chain that I'm just so cautious with those guys of making making changes. If they're in pain and we have to make a change, then we'll figure out where can we have the greatest effect with the least intervention. Mm -hmm. And we'll make the change there and we'll be very cautious and we'll tiptoe into the change and we'll make sure it feels good and we'll make sure the velocity numbers are there. And then we'll commit to the change and we'll work on patterning it. But there's just so many, so many coaches where like a little, a little knowledge is dangerous because they'll be so convinced that this is the solution. They'll just hammer it. And before they know it, you know, 
it affects the guy's arm health or it affects the guy's command or it, now he can't throw his breaking ball. Um, and we just see it over and over and over again. So I'm very much on, along the lines of you, like getting stronger is never a bad, never a bad thing. It's like, we can always check that box. You're never going to ruin a guy by getting his shoulder stronger, getting his flexor stronger, getting his body stronger. But mechanically, it's just, there's so much we don't know biomechanically that we just have to be careful when intervening and making changes there and like make sure that we are very sure um especially if they're already having success we also in pro baseball we we have adjustment logs this is really important people who even are in coaching at any level having a very detailed record you know the date um the coaching approach athletes response to the coaching approach and uh and then being able to take that and follow up with all the other analyses that you're going to do in between um you kind of see all right yeah this has been two weeks we're not really seeing an improvement it's like okay well as a coach you have to be okay pivoting you know in in the way to address it with a player it's like hey i, I i'm i'm a consultant to you i'm not the director i'm not your dictator and i'm not perfect but i'm going to be taking record of what i'm doing with you and i'm giving myself a, a two-week time w window okay but I'm not seeing improvement then. I need to adjust. Okay. So you have to be adaptable with me and you have to be able to pivot. Okay. And I'm using data. I'm not trying to just use my, hey, I worked with player X, this worked with him or player B, or I want you to be like player B. I'm trying to focus on you. And it allows the coach to be in a place where the player's like, okay, well, this guy's humble. He's he's allowing me to have a little bit more guidance in my approach. And, um, you know, it, and it allows you to, to really follow up because we get caught in things and we, we go down rabbit holes, we make one decision and then we want to do something else. And, you know, the body is like your brain. If you're throwing algebra at it and calculus and physics and, you know, all of these things, it, it, it's, it's pretty, it's, it's tough to process. And so having sort of a clear direction, I love what you said, because we go through, um, the strength first, mechanic second approach, and we have two tiers, and, and categorize what are the what are some of the key uh, biomechanical corrections to some of our factors. You got to use the, the the lowest dangling fruit. You have to say, okay, well, well, research has shown that athletes can make the most adjustments before the foot hits the ground. Okay, they can adopt those quicker. So. And, and what's crazy is that research in baseball and biomechanics, they usually start when the foot hits the ground because that's where the highest forces are for the arm and everybody wants to track that. But when it comes to coaching, everything that happens before the foot hits the ground can be retained really well. And then when, you know, when the foot hits the ground, you got a brief instant of arm positioning and then it all goes haywire. It's too fast. You it's can't, you can't make adjustments at that point. You, you, you wind this, you wind and load the spring in the leg lift and that, initial move and like you just really you're releasing the spring at that point you're not gonna you're not gonna make any change at that point of the throw it's like it's a fool's errand to try to chase like outside of like maybe you know feeling where the ball is on you know on the fingertips or something like that at ball release you know mo most nope. changes even though you want to understand how that how the throw finishes you want to understand what's going on there but uh, again what you're what you're getting at is like where is the actual underlying cause and where does the intervention need to go Yep. It's almost always in terms of like how they're loading into the back leg, the initial move, the initial leg lift, like something in the very start of the throw and something proximal, like center of the body, start of the throw. A lot of times if you fix that up, it cleans up a lot of the downstream stuff versus chasing. You might see some stuff that's going on downstream. You might see their elbow pushing. You might see bad layback. You might see them flying open. Why is that happening? And where do you intervene? Right. And you don't want to, you don't necessarily want to intervene at the end of the throw. Intervene, figure out trace it all back to the origin and if a lot of times it's the first move it's you know how they're loading the back leg it's how they come set on the rubber is their foot angled in even angled out hooking the rubber does that match how their hips work and so we again we will try to observe all that stuff but trace it back like where do you actually need to intervene to get the most bang for your buck low hanging fruit like and actually that cleans up a lot of the downstream stuff. So where, where do you think that private coaches fit in kind of the MLB model, right? Like these players pretty much monitored in season, but they go out 
you know, they go home in the off seasons. The, the oversight is a lot less. A lot of them have their own facilities they train at, uh, coaches they work with in the off seasons. Like, how do you, how do you see the private coach, uh, you know, model fitting into the MLB model or fitting into the pro model uh, to be able to help some of these guys in the off season? Yeah, I think, I, I think it's critical. One of the things that I really, I valued in pro ball, but I really value now is how much learning occurs outside of the walls of your organization. I have my son, Cameron, and he's small. He's three years old and I'm seeing him every day. And in my mind, I'm like, this kid's tiny. He is so small. You know, when's he going to grow? Then my mom comes in town who hasn't seen Cameron for four months. And she walks in the door is like, look at how big you've got, you know? And I'm like, ah. right. and I'm looking at my mom I'm like, are you SHIT in me? He's tiny. And she's like, no, last time I saw him, he was here on my thigh. Look at where he is now. And so for me, it's like you get a different perspective, a different context, because you're fo you're focused on this athlete constantly. Right. Um, and one of the, the things that um, how I kind of led got led to Brent, he was he showcased a, a abstract that I wrote in college and someone emailed me. He's like, Hey, you got to check this dude out. He's putting out research. He's putting out these posters. And, uh, it was my first experience and I was working for, um, the Orioles at the time. And it was the first experience I had is like, Oh my gosh, like these private guys, they know a ton. They actually know our players, some of them better than what we do. So for me, it's like, I, I realized very early on in my career that, um, I didn't have all the answers and uh, the players have a closer relationship with um, their private coaches that I needed to be able to uh, tap into. And um, they're looking at their movement differently. And, um, you know, we were able to, you know, just watching videos and some of the things I watched your stuff too, is just identifying, Hey, you know, this makes sense for this player. Why are we not doing it? Why have we not contacted that person? And what can happen is you run into egos and ego is the enemy. There's a book. I haven't read it. I, it's on my night table. I need to read it. But when you don't tap into all your resources for your player, you're doing an injustice to the player. And, uh, and for me, you know, with this arm care device, if I was still in major league baseball, I would be tickled pink knowing that my, organization has a limited amount of funding for monitoring for personnel for me for me to help my players but all my players have private coaches like can you imagine that i had this interweb of all these guys who are focused on my guys and they're texting me they're emailing me they're calling me i would literally work from home i would probably have more time with my wife and my children and not work 80 hours a week and, uh, you know, having all these internal emails that, you know, going back and forth about, you know, what they're seeing or like getting frustrated when one of my guys gets pulled away and doing a different project on hitting when we have pitching injuries. Right. But I say, like, you know what? I got 150 pitchers and I got 75 people monitoring my athletes and giving me information um, to, to help us, you know, and then all of a sudden it's like, you're a pitching coordinator or you're a major league pitching coach and you got that kind of support and you're getting information like this daily, constantly, you will execute a hundred percent times better. And in the end of the, in, in, at the end of it all, it's like the player has to be successful. The team has to win equals you getting paid and everybody being happy because we're, you're creating this like great, seamless connection between in season and off season. And it's, it's unanimous throughout the entire league, the highest amount of pitching injuries, they happen early season. It's because they're not monitored. Okay. Or there's no communication. There really wasn't a dynamometry approach. And now there is so that, you know, when the athlete comes on board, Hey, we fixed all his deficiencies. Cause like Ben's my guy, he's got player X and we're talking. And, um, he's, he's telling me what he's doing in training and, uh, and I'm just, you know, I'm checking the boxes and I'm like, you know, this, this guy's going to be prepared when he comes back or consequently, another guy is not, not doing as well. 
you know, and everybody's on the dashboard talking about it. Um, and it's just, it's just continuing this individualization because I do see this too, when players come back and this has been in my experience as well with some key players and they've worked with a private coach and the private coach gets them out of pain and they're throwing better, but it wasn't what the organization drafted the player as. So one player we got, he worked with a, a well-known coach, changed his throwing habits and I saw it and I watched him throw in the kid. It looked smooth. It didn't look herky jerky, had better layback. He was just, it looked great. His arm slot changed. Okay. It changed a little bit on the ball motion. He wasn't throwing the batter. So that was a knock and that could be a problem, but he came in for the first time to spring training with his arm feeling great. Okay. Subjectively, when a player thinks that what they're doing is good and they feel good, they definitely are going to have better outcomes performance wise and in health. And then, you know, we got into a meeting, we were looking at the videos and I remember pushing our, our coordinators contact this coach. I've been, I've been talking to him. Hey, I'm the director of performance integration. That's not my, my world is focusing on, on the pitchers programming contact this guy. And it didn't happen. And we got into this room and we just started throwing daggers, daggers. You know, and in my heart, I was like, okay, you know, if you, if you're not happy with the way he's throwing now, why didn't you communicate, you know, four months ago when he's reprogrammed the way he's throwing, I said it in the meeting, he now has acquired a different motor preference, you know, and I try to be forceful, but the strongest voices in the room are obviously the higher level front office people. And the communication was, this is not what we drafted. And this is not what we're going to stand for. Okay. 13 days, Tommy John surgery for this poor kid. Never been the same. People don't know this, that after a surgery, and I, I think I mentioned it, but after your primary Tommy John surgery, you have about an 85 to 86% chance of coming back to where you were. It's even less going beyond where you were. And in three to four years, you're out of baseball. This kid is 19 years old. So now it's like, okay, we had a prospect, probably not going to be anything for us. We're going to just exist in our minor league system and may never, ever hit arbitration. So he's not going to make the money that he's planning to make. Okay. And it all comes down to that lack of trust between the person who's trying to do right for the player. And, and honestly, sending me videos, I was sending them back and forth. And, and probably if we looked at the arm strength at that time, it would have it would probably show that his arm strength was in a better place. He might have been less fatigable because he was more efficient, you know, and, and maybe he had that great strength and length balance that he didn't have to use a lot of muscle force because he had that like the right amount of stretch, the right amount of, uh, of force. But, you know, the private coach to me is essential. It is. And, um, I think teams that can figure out how to create relationships, like I, that's what I love about my job now. I have met thousands of people that, that email me and ask questions and, you know, they're reading my stuff on LinkedIn, which I really like. I didn't start doing a post until March when I was hired and the learning I'm having, like being with you and being with some of these leaders and, and watching their stuff and some of the people that actually go out and it's just, they're showing you how they coach, man. It's not just like an image or a video where a player is doing something. Like I'm listening to your language. I'm listening to the purpose. Like it's like I'm, I'm getting educated. I don't know how people aren't doing this all over the place and not making the calls, not making friends. You know, it's like it's sad. And, and again, the player, in my opinion, suffers from our own personal egos and our lack of intellectual curiosity to learn from someone else. I think that's so important to be able to get an out, outside perspective, or at least a qualified outside perspective. Um, obviously, I think the fear within organizations is likely, hey, there's a risk that if you totally just unleash these guys to the outside world, like some of them might get screwed up by, you know, mm -hmm. coaches who don't know what they're doing um, or aren't willing to keep the organization in the loop. Like I could definitely see that uh, being a factor, but finding and identifying those right relationships and the coaches, the private coaches that they do trust and, you know, making sure the athlete does have that oversight in the off season. 
Uh, I think that's an important piece, but obviously the details do matter and not just like letting them go to whatever local guy they just happen to know back home and, you know, zero oversight whatsoever or zero communication whatsoever. So I think the details do matter in some of the relationships that we're building with organizations. Like, you know, they want to know co communication. They, they want regular updates. They want to understand the why. If we're going to make a, a major change or suggest a major change, like they want to understand why and be be a part of that conversation. It's not, you know, it's not like, hey, we get to just take full control and take the reins. Um, it's a collaboration and that's how we approach it. And organizations have been very receptive to approaching it that way. We're an outside perspective. We might see something that you're not seeing. You might see something in season that we're not seeing because you know now you're the one with the player all day. And so that can be a very cohesive relationship if it's done properly. And I know, you know, speaking personally with the guys that I work with, um, you know, through the off season and even in season consulting with them while they're, you know, competing. And I, I had three guys that were in the World Series. I work with three guys that competed in the World Series this year. Um, I'll still go and get outside perspective. I'll still talk to, you know, a coach down the hall and be like, what are you seeing with this guy? And sometimes they see something that I'm not seeing. And so that's valuable and being able to put the ego aside and say, like, look, I'm going to have my blind spots. I'm going to have my biases. But together and in a collaborative approach and including the athlete in that, not just other coaches, but including the athlete in that, that's when you can start to get closer to the truth and get closer towards, you know, helping put the athlete on top versus just making it about you or making it about somebody else. I remember my first year with the Cardinals as a short season player. I was mentored by a guy named Mark Dijon, um, who is like a he, he's just a really well known baseball person um, in in the industry, and everybody who's around him, he just gives you life lessons. And he would always tell me a story about this employee. I shouldn't even say employee. This guy's a rock star. I can't remember the name, unfortunately, but he worked for the Cardinals for 60 years. Okay. With one organization, various roles. I don't know if he managed, but he would tell me in his off season, this guy would attend high school um, coaching events and he wasn't presenting at them. He just, he would show up to them to see if there's one thing that he learned that can give the, the, the team a, an advantage it was well worth his weight. And I kept thinking to myself, I'm like, man, that's amazing. Like he's going to the high school level, not college. You know, there wasn't a lot of these different conventions that are going on now that, that have a lot of experts in the field. And um, it really made me think it's like, you know, this makes sense because you'll learn something from, from everybody. You know, you might, I don't know, there might be a drill that you do. Um, I know one, I know one that I really liked um, that you put out uh, in particular. Because I always wondered, there were a lot of athletes that would come to me and say, well, you know, they'd have tricep pain. You know, and tricep pain is sort of new for me because the shoulder and elbow, but on the inside. Um, and um, so one day I went and watched them work out and, you know, they they did their plyo care routine. And I was taking video. So I, I was videoing them from long toss to line toss to mound to... Um, weighted ball training to plyo care training and i was noticing man they're all throwing so differently but then when i was they had a, a a portable wall that they would wheel out and i was able to actually stand behind like on the oncoming throw of mm. the guy doing the plyo care routine and it was amazing to me because now he went from an internal rotation delivery to like an archer yeah like he's throwing a dart Right. And so just around the same time, when I saw that you put out, um, like you put out something on, uh, targeting, um, and, and, and really like I saw it and I was like, holy crap, this is the big problem. I'm like, I can even, I can, not only is he teaching this, but I see it like the, the athlete throws from here, but now it's completely pushy. So now the shoulders out of the equation. And the acceleration is happening at the elbow. I'll, I'll, you know, albeit that it's it's lower velocity, but it's still it's unaccustomed, right? So I went back to that. I went back to that uh, facility, and I and I said, you know, I'm kind of helping out this player, um, and uh, that he was working with. And I said, this is something I'm seeing, and I'm showing the video. And I was like, well, there and there's a video on this from Tread. You can you can take a look at it. And I think you know that's going to really clear it up. And and honestly, they they had that portable wall. And I remember they had to move it. He's a right-hander, way right. And then literally I checked in with him maybe like five weeks after. And I said, are you still doing plyo care routine with him? He's like, oh, yeah. 
yeah. And I'm like, is he pain free? He's like, yep. I'm like, well, you know, you created some consistency there. And that was a learning moment that I utilized from you, um, you know, uh, from the stuff you put out, which I think is fantastic because you coach. It's not just like flashing things um, that I was able to apply and, and really help a player. You know, so it's, you know, if people did that more often, there'd just be a, a way better brand of baseball and a healthier brand of baseball, I think. Yeah. And that, that type of thing takes, you know, like for us to figure that out. And that took us a couple of years to figure out, like, we've been talking about that now for like four years, but that took us a couple of years to figure out. You need to understand the biomechanics. Like, what are we ideally looking for? Like, we don't, this is not ideal. Like, but some coaches no. coach that that's ideal. So like, first you need to understand how do we want the arm to move? You now you need to actually pay attention video, like how are they actually moving? And then when you start to see those deficiencies, you need to figure out why. And like in that case, like it's the the narrow plyo walls are like the narrow plyo walls and going too heavy on weighted balls, like using a two or four pound ball regularly. Like those yeah. are two most common issues of pushing because the narrow wall, like they want to hit the center of the wall. And so what do they do? They dart throw to hit the center of the wall versus they completely right. miss the wall if, if they actually let their arm spiral out how it wants to. And then four pound ball, well, you're not going to get clean layback like this with an eight pound ball or a four pound ball. So what do you do? Well, you use the tricep to accelerate. You, you know, Sorry. now it's, it's, a, it's a push. It's not, a, it's not the catapult. It's not the internal rotation. It's more of a tricep dominant push. So right. I mean, we're, we've come to realize a lot of these things just over time through trial and error, through trying to develop athletes, through trying a lot of the drills that were already out there realizing like half of them don't work and how can we how can we make them better how can we put this information out there for people to learn from and so we we're open sourcing everything i mean 99 percent of our stuff if we have some sort of breakthrough like i tweet about it we make a video about it we're not like hoarding this information we're trying to empower coaches we're trying to empower athletes you know maybe one in a hundred of the athletes that see our stuff reaches out signs up that's great the other 99 we're still hoping to help them still hoping to put information in their hands still hoping to give their coaches information. So, um, you know, again, that's why we're doing the podcast today. Like trying to put your information out in front of people, our information out in front of people and just collectively just keep learning. Yeah, man. It's awesome. Hey, this was a lot of fun. I know we, uh, we dragged on a little bit longer than we initially anticipated, but I told you we'd be getting on a roll. So, um, <laughs> yeah. again, always, awesome. always happy to do this. It's, it's a uh, great talking to you and, you know, hopefully people can follow your stuff. Um, where can they find you? Where can they follow you to kind of yeah, get so an idea of I'm, out? I'm really active on LinkedIn and uh, I, I, I'm starting to put out more coaching stuff there. A lot of it was heavy science, but I'm going to show you kind of more of the application. And, uh, you know, you can email me with uh, armcare.com. It's really easy. Ryan at armcare.com. You know, I usually get a lot of questions there and you can join our newsletter. I put a lot of stuff out there as well. Um, but you know, Ben, I'm, I'm really grateful, man, because, uh, you know, you're giving me a platform to talk to people in the same manner of educating and, and really trying to impact people in a positive way. So, um, I'm really thankful for today, man. I know we're getting close to Thanksgiving and, um, it's important to tell other people how much you, you appreciate them and, and what they mean to you. And I always love getting texts from you and questions and, um, it helps my own learning, man. So thanks. Awesome, man. Yeah, no, thanks for being on and uh, hopefully people learn something from this.